And so what I want to do today is, you know, we've done so much football. I want to take a step back, take a deep breath. And what I want to do, I want to talk a little college basketball with the 10 biggest storylines, six weeks away, practices beginning. What better time to get you ready for the season ahead than by talking storylines for college basketball? As I said, allow you to kind of dust off the cobwebs, get you kind of get that brain refocused on everything that happened. So let's talk about it. My 10 biggest storylines, we'll do five now, break them up, come back and do five more. The number one college basketball storyline, drum roll please. I think you probably maybe know what it is. It is to me the simple question of this. Can North Carolina finish the job? And I think we all remember back to last year. But for those of you who do not remember, North Carolina, year one of the Huber Davis era, it was a bumpy road out of the gate, okay? Early in the season, this team really, really, really struggled. They got smoked by Kentucky in Vegas. They got smoked by Tennessee at Mohegan Sun. They lost to Purdue. They got smoked by Miami early in the uh, ACC portion of play. Got smoked by Wake Forest. And everybody kind of gave up on North Carolina about midway through the year, myself included. It is kind of funny in hindsight. People say, oh, you know, how could people be so critical of Hubert Davis? Well, they weren't very good. And he inherited and returned a lot of talent from the previous year when Roy Williams was the head coach. And so I think anybody that criticized UNC was justified. And as a matter of fact, I know they were justified because Hubert Davis at the Final Four said we deserved all of the flack that we got in the middle of the year. But to his credit, it took time. He got the guys to buy in. And over the final two months of the season, they were awesome. They go on a run. They finished 13 and three over the final two months of the season. I think we all remember they beat Duke at Cameron in Coach K's final home game. They beat Duke in the final four to end Coach K's career. But what was crazy about that run, they did ultimately fall short in the national championship game to Kansas. Rock Chalk, Jayhawk, your national champions. But when it was all said and done, something very interesting happened. They basically returned their entire team from last year. Now, they did lose Brady Manick, the, the big wing uh, shooter, kid with the long hair, white guy from Oklahoma, the transfer from Oklahoma. But thanks in large part to NIL, they returned a ton of talent from last year's team. Armando Baycott, I think it's easy to forget this. He was the runner-up for the ACC Player of the Year. And when you talk about a guy that just was dominant in the NCAA tournament. I don't remember a player doing what he did in the tournament the way that he did it. 15 points, 15 rebounds, playing on a bad ankle against Kansas. 11 points, 21 rebounds against Duke. 20 points, 22 rebounds against uh, against St. Peter's in the Elite Eight. And so that guy comes back. R.J. Davis, of course, the, the kind of combo guard who kind of took over point guard duties comes back. And then the big one, uh, Caleb Love, second leading scorer, 16 points per game. The guy who really blew up in the NCAA tournament. He announces late that he is coming back as well. And North Carolina got the band back together. A team that was one, you know, one game away from winning a national championship returns four of its top five scores, five of its top seven scores, and four starters. Oh, by the way, also, the one spot where they did not return a starting player, they had Pete Nance, a very talented transfer from Northwestern. And so going into this year, I'll be honest, listen, I, I know the Betfred Sportsbook actually does not have North Carolina as its favorite. They have Gonzaga and Houston. We'll talk about both those teams in a minute as co-favorites. I think North Carolina should be the favorite. They return a ton. Those guys bought into Hubert Davis. And I think more importantly, when you have that many guys come back, when you have that many guys give up money at the professional level, and I know they're making money in college now, but when you have that many guys bought in, what it means to me is they are coming back with one goal and one mission, that is to win a national championship. Can they finish the job, get back to the Final Four, and ultimately win it? We will find out. But to me, that is the biggest story in college basketball coming into the year. I don't know if it's by far, but to me, it's certainly one of the two or three biggest. Number two, let's just stay on Tobacco Road. And I just mentioned Coach K lost his final regular season game as head coach. Coach K lost in the final four to North Carolina. And so North Carolina will forever have bragging rights over Coach K. But now, for the first time since the 19, I think, 79, 80 season, 
We have a new head coach at Duke. Think about that. Since 1979-80, some of you probably have parents that weren't even born in 79-80, or at the very least, you weren't born. Your parents were probably, you were just a twinkle in the eye of your parents. Duke has a new head coach in John Shire. And a couple quick thoughts here. One, I'm not going to do the, you know, criticize Duke and blah, 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 blah. And as a matter of fact, I'll actually take the opposite approach. I know everybody, myself included, we did kind of make fun of the whole um, retirement tour last year with Coach K. But as I've said a few times now, it actually worked out very nicely for Duke because what it allowed Coach K to do was stay back with his team in Durham last summer, not this past summer, but the summer before, Paolo Bancaro, A.J. Griffin, all those guys, allows him to be with the team, spend time with them, and then it allowed John Shire to go on the road and recruit and go ahead and lock up what ended up being the number one class in the country. And oh, by the way, I know everybody's going to say, oh, obviously Coach K was really recruiting. Well, he wasn't at recruiting events. Now, I can't say what he said or did not say once the kids got to campus, but he did not recruit two summers ago. But John Shire was allowed to focus on recruiting. He put he signed the number one class in high school basketball last year. Uh, three basically top five players in that class. Kyle Filipowski, big man. Derek Lively, a seven foot two center that reminds me a lot of Willie Cauley Stein, formerly of Kentucky. Derek Whitehead, who unfortunately is out to injury. Um, and it really put Duke in a great position. They also, on top of signing that number one class, they return uh, Jeremy Roach, who was really good last year uh, as the starting point guard. Really, he elevated his game. That was when Duke kind of went to the next level late in the year, went on that final four run. And finally, I'll say this, man. Listen, I don't know if John Shire is going to be good. I don't know if he's not going to be good. Nobody knows. I do give him credit for one thing, though. I thought he really, this offseason, put his own stamp on the Duke basketball program. And here's how he did it. He did it in a few different ways. One, we talked about it at the time. He hired kind of a, a couple new position, you know, you know, new coaching staff members, gets Jay Lucas from Kentucky, brings in a GM uh, from Nike to specifically handle NIL deals. But on top of that and beyond that, I thought he did a good job around the NBA draft deadline of making sure that he did not come into this season shorthanded. Remember, that NBA draft deadline hits, sometimes you lose key players, and he had a player in Trevor Keels that was right on the fence right up until the end. What most coaches would do, they would sit and beg and hope and plead, and when that kid ends up leaving, they would, oh, you know, the system is so this, and it's not fair, and we need to make the deadline earlier. He had a backup plan and a backup plan to the backup plan, okay? He went out and signed Jacob Grandison, a really talented guard from Illinois. Now, he was a little bit hurt during the offseason, so I don't know how much he was even able to practice with the team, and that is worth noting coming into the year. But this is a kid that has played big games, uh, again, was at Illinois for those back-to-back -back Big Ten championships, tournament championship in 2021, regular season championship in 2022, shot 41% from three. And then they also added another five-star late, a kid named Tyrese Proctor from Australia, who was committed for the class of 2023 and enrolled a year early. So I give John Shire credit. He's got a loaded roster, loaded team. And the thing is, we're going to find out really early how good he is, right? They obviously play uh, Kansas in the Champions Classic in what will be his debut game. And then on top of that, they go to the PK-80, where I believe they could face Gonzaga when it's all said and done. Uh, they play a, a couple marquee games outside of that uh, in the non-conference. They do play, obviously, in the uh, Big Ten ACC Challenge. And that is a game that will be interesting to kind of follow early in the season. They will host Ohio State. So we're going to find out about this team really quickly, really fascinating, really fun. I am very intrigued by this Duke team coming into this year and John Shire as Duke's new head coach. Let's keep it going. Number three, and we're going to take a quick break after five. So don't worry. I'm not just going to rant for 45 minutes straight here to lead the show. Number three is really about number nine at Kentucky. And listen, it, you know, Kentucky, I got to say, man, I don't know if there's a college sports program, forget basketball, where there's more stuff that just happens in the off season than at Kentucky. And it, it's crazy because it feels like a million years ago that Kentucky lost to St. Peter's in the opening round of the NCAA tournament. And I remember coming on this show that night and saying point blank, you know, Cal is essentially out of excuses. Cal has to get this thing turned around. And I said at the time, I said, 
I don't think there is anything John Calipari can do to win back this fan base until the 2023 NCAA tournament. With that said, think about everything that has happened since that St. Peter's loss. You had the announcement that Oscar Shibwe is returning, national player of the year, back to Kentucky. You had the announcement that Shaden Sharp, number one player in last year's class, enrolled early last year, never played, is leaving for the NBA without playing for a second in a Kentucky uniform. You had, obviously, I just mentioned, your top assistant go to Duke. You also had the Gonzaga stuff. You had the Mark Stoop stuff. You had everything that happened. But now we're back to where things ended in March. It's about what happens on the court. By the way, Kentucky went and took a summer tour in the Bahamas. But it's about what happens on the court. And it's about do you get Kentucky at the very least back to the Final Four, if not compete for championship number nine in the Bluegrass. And what I would say about this one is it's pretty straightforward. I don't think, I, listen, I don't know how long John Calipari plans on doing this, but he's in his early to mid-60s. I think it's hard to make the argument he's going to have a better opportunity to at least get to the final weekend, let alone win a title, than this year. One, you had the Bahamas trip, so you got some games under your belt. But two, you got the reigning national player of the year coming back in Oscar Shibwe. On top of that, on top of that, you also have uh, a, a, a multi-year starter in the SEC at point guard and severe Wheeler. You have some really talented freshmen, Casey Wallace and Chris Livingston. And I'll take it a step further. You got a superstar in the making in Jacob Toppin. And it's weird to sit here and say, oh, you know, the, Kentucky's most important player is anyone other than Oscar Sheepway. I do think it's Jacob Toppin, though. This guy is bursting with potential. He was behind Keon Brooks last year, the starting power forward, and now he is going to take over. And if you watch those Bahamas games, I mean, 26, 28, 31 points, step back threes. He looks like an NBA player playing in college. And as I've said many times with him, what I love about Jacob Toppin is the fact that he played his best in games against the best competition last year. He was great against Auburn, great against LSU, great against Alabama. And I think with a big, you know, with knowing that he's the guy, knowing that he is the one that is going to have the ball in his hands and it's not going to be a, a power forward by committee or whatever you want to call it, I guess, you know, whatever. But knowing that there's nobody in front of him, I cannot wait to see what this guy does. I think he's all SEC first teamer and all over him. So excited about Jacob Toppin in year three at the University of Kentucky. Let's get to number four. Number five, we'll take a quick break. Number four, let's just stay with the rest of the SEC because this to me, listen, I don't know if it's better than the Big 12. Big 12 is really good. Kansas, Baylor, TCU is going to be good this year. Texas is interesting. Oklahoma is good. Texas Tech is good. Every team in the Big 12 is good. Iowa State made the Sweet 16 last year. This is the best that the SEC has ever been, and it's certainly the most intriguing. Outside of Kentucky, we have Arkansas, who's its own separate topic. So we're going to save that for part two. You have Alabama, won the regular season two years ago, struggled this past year. And when I say struggled, this is how bad it was at Alabama. And I'm using bad in air quotes. They got a six seed in the NCAA tournament. They beat Gonzaga. They beat Houston in the regular season. Gonzaga goes to the Sweet 16, Houston to the Elite Eight. So apparently it wasn't that bad at Alabama, but they've regrouped. I really like the roster that Nate Oates has. Another team that got a foreign tour under their belt. Auburn, Bruce Pearl is going to be really good. Janai Broom, we talked about him with Bruce Pearl over the summer. Really, really talented player. Um, you know, and I think even with the big, with, with the SEC, what's interesting to me is even the bad teams are interesting. And even the, 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 the teams that have new coaches kind of hit the ground running, right? Because it used to be you get a new coach, unless it's John Calipari, who's got two McDonald's All-Americans, three McDonald's All-Americans committed to the last place. It's a slow build. Well, now with the portal, it ain't got to be that way anymore. Florida with Todd Golden. I call him young Sheldon boy wonder. Remember, this was a guy that, uh, you know, 36, 37 years old, led San Francisco to a, a uh, NCAA tournament bid last year. Very analytically inclined, all that stuff. I bring it up because he's at Florida and they killed in the portal. Will Richard from Davidson. Um, or Belmont, excuse me. I think I said Davidson. Alex Fudge from LSU. They bring back Colin Castleton. They're interesting. LSU, friend of the Aaron Torres pod, Matt McMahon, did a great job in the offseason, had to convince 13 players to come to LSU. Remember, at one point, he had zero scholarship players. Uh, Missouri with Dennis Gates, I think, is going to be good. Mississippi State with Chris Jans is going to be good. Um, even South Carolina, which I don't think will be good. Remember, they got the kid Gigi Jackson, 
the number one high school player in America who reclassified. So just a fascinating league. So excited for the SEC. So excited to see who emerges, who steps back. By the way, I didn't even mention Tennessee. Rocky Top Tennessee. Those fans are going to get mad at me. Rick Barnes, say what you want about him. That is a team that is built for the regular season at the very least. They're going to be really good. Santiago Vescovi's back. Zakai Ziegler's back. Euros Plavic is back. Really excited about the SEC. I think Tennessee might end up being the best team when it's all said and done, uh, at least in the regular season. But Kentucky, Arkansas, Alabama, Auburn at the top of the league. It is going to be a war every single night. Let's get to number five and we'll take a quick break, okay? Number five, the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Is it finally the year for Gonzaga? I don't know. But say this for Mark Few. Every single year he's got a team good enough, and then it just comes down to whether they'll do it or not. We all know from Gonzaga last year they lose to Arkansas in the Sweet 16. They did lose their two best players off that team. Andrew Nemhard, late first round, early second round pick. I forget exactly. I think he was the first pick of the second round. And, of course, Chet Holmgren, who was the number two overall pick, unfortunately did deal with an injury in summer league. But, actually, I think it was at a – one of those uh, pro-ams. I take that back. It wasn't a pro-am. But Chet Holmgren and Andrew nemhard has gone. But Drew Timmy is back. Fourth year, National Player of the Year candidate. One of the most decorated players, not only in college basketball, but in college basketball history coming into this season. Um, and when I look at that team, I just see a team that, once again, they're going to be in the conversation. They added through the portal. Malachi Smith, transfer from Chattanooga, three-point shooter. Uh, Efton Reed transfer from LSU, really good player. Uh, and the guards are going to be really good as well. Hunter Salas is back. Nolan Hickman is back. Julian Strother on the wing, I think might be their best NBA prospect. Now I do think some of those guards got to step up. Nolan Hickman, Hunter Salas, it's year two. They have to make a leap for Gonzaga to be a national championship contender. And I'll also say this about Gonzaga. We're going to find out early just how good that team is. They play to open the season. They will play Michigan State on an aircraft carrier. I'm trying to go to that game. I'm trying to go to that game. We'll see if it happens. Uh, they will play Gonzaga, or they will play Kentucky, obviously in Spokane. They will play at Texas. Chris Beard is obviously the head coach there. They will play in the PK80 Invitational. They're going to play Alabama in Birmingham. They are going to be a traveling circus over the first probably six weeks of the season. We'll see. With Gonzaga, they're one of those programs. It always comes down to what they do in March. And we'll see if they ultimately have success. Whew. All right, let's take a quick break. Uh, that was part one of the most intriguing storylines in college basketball. Remember, practice started today. We're going to come back, take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk about parts uh, six through 10. We're going to talk about Arkansas. We're going to talk about Indiana, my boy, Mike Effin Woodson. We're going to talk about some other conferences, some other players, some other coaches. Take a quick break. We will be 